Tess, Tess, thank you so much. Good morning, good morning. It's a beautiful Sabbath morning out there. We're heading into the warm days of summer, warm nights. I have to confess that cool winter was really lovely and wonderful. And uh, I love winter in Hawaii, it's fabulous. Well, my name is Tony Ingersoll, as most of you know, and uh, I say welcome to all in the sanctuary. Uh, welcome to all joining us on YouTube. Uh, we're so thankful to have you uh, committed to studying your Bible this morning. And uh, kind of exciting and sad at the same time that we're doing the last lesson of our quarterly on Psalms. And then next uh, week we go to the new quarter, which is uh, called The Great Controversy. And it's written by Mark Finley, a uh, well-known Adventist evangelist and preacher. And uh, if you don't have a quarterly, please let me know. If you're on YouTube, just send me a text or call me, and I will deliver it to you. So I've got some left, and if you need one, please let me know. So this morning is a little bit different in that we did not start with our mission story. We're going to go right into the lesson. But I am going to end early because we have a very special mission story starting at 1015. And that's uh, Marie Pakleb is uh, going to be presenting her mission trip to Cambodia. Uh, 30 minutes, about roughly 30 minutes. And we want to give her a nice chunk of time because she's one of our family members here. And we really wanted to hear about her mission experience. So at... Um, 1015 if uh, people are at Sabbath school classes and the other divisions they can come back in if they want but Marie Pakleb at 1015 will be doing the uh, mission story Cambodia so let's jump into our, our lesson on Psalms as I said we're on the very last lesson study uh, page 100 of your quarterly and this lesson is called wait wait on the Lord good morning sis wait on the Lord but let's ask the Holy Spirit to join us this morning so that we can gain wisdom from his word. Heavenly Father, we are bowed, our heads, our hearts to you, acknowledging our need of you. As we study this morning, Lord, about waiting, help us appreciate and understand what this is all about, this waiting, uh, that it gives us actual hope and we have something to look forward to in this fallen world. But most importantly, Father, we cannot discern or understand your word without your Holy Spirit's help. We cannot overcome temptation without your Holy Spirit's help. So please, this morning, send your Holy Spirit as we study your word, as we study the Bible, especially about these um, Psalms lessons about waiting. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Wait on the Lord. Waiting is not always easy to do, especially if you're like me and you tend to be a, an impatient person. <laughs> Requires a lot of uh, prayer for the Lord to help me understand the concept of long-suffering. <laughs> but that's what we're talking about here, long-suffering, waiting, patience. And you know, the concept of waiting, especially in the book of Psalms, uh, denotes having and demonstrating an enduring faith. Because faith is really trust in the Lord's promises for something that's yet to come. And that means waiting. So waiting is a big part of our lives, but we have to see where it's, uh, or understand what it's about so that we can not be like me sometimes, impatient and grumpy about the, having to wait, but, but joyful and thankful that we have this waiting period because there's a purpose for it. And so it denotes having, um, having and demonstrating this enduring faith. Uh, we're called to wait upon the Lord for the fulfillment of his promises. So we claim a promise, but we have to sometimes wait. Sometimes when our prayers, he says yes, he says no, but sometimes he says wait. And so waiting is a big, important part of Christian maturity. And for example, you think of Abraham and Sarah, when the Lord promised Sarah that she was going to have a child, 
and here she is in her what 90s perhaps and then it was a delay there and she had to, they had to wait and they had to wait and they had to wait 25 years so I guess she was maybe in her 70s when she was told 60s or 70s and then she uh, didn't have her child until she was in her 90s I believe and then Israel waited for deliverance remember the 430 years in Egypt that's a long wait 430 that's what about 16 17 maybe 18 generations right there that's a lot of waiting but there was a purpose for it and um, Israel waited for what for the deliverance for the Messiah remember they were waiting for the first coming of Jesus now they misunderstood the prophecy and assume that the first coming of Jesus was actually the pro uh, prophecies about the second coming and so they misread it but nonetheless they were waiting another Bible character that we know well that waited <coughs> was Daniel <coughs> so you remember Daniel was one of the first captives when Babylon was taken the first time then the second time Babylon was taken and then the third time Babylon was destroyed well he was up in in uh, with Nebuchadnezzar at that time and he saw the 70 year prophecy in Jeremiah and he was waiting 70 years as a servant there with the with uh, Nebuchadnezzar and then eventually with uh, Cyrus and Dar Darius but 70 years he waited and waited for what for the promise of God that they would indeed return to their home and uh, the Jews also waited hundreds of years for that promised Messiah as we talked about until that fullness of time was was reached so waiting has kind of two variables to it okay waiting two variables the first one is anticipation anticipation and that's anticipation of the fulfillment of the promise we claim a promise and then we anticipate we wait for its fulfillment and then the second one is expectation so we have we have um, anticipation but then we have expectation what is it we're expecting well we're expecting that what was promised will be fulfilled within a certain time frame we claim the promise we don't know when necessarily but we wait for it so those are two important uh, aspects or variables of waiting anticipation and expectations and you know a lapse of time must transpire as we know between the anticipation of the event itself and its fulfillment so that's that waiting period and the same is true for all of God's promises so with that introduction about waiting let's go to Sabbath afternoon <coughs> pardon me and um, again, this lesson, Lesson 13, is entitled, Wait on the Lord. At the bottom of the lesson there, it says this, uh, Waiting on the Lord is not, is not an idle and desperate biding of one's time. Okay, so he's really honest. They'll say, yeah, this is a gloomy place. I mean, look at the crime, look at the misery, homelessness, death, sickness. I just dealt with a serious sickness at the hospital for two days. So, yeah, it's a gloomy world we live in. But we have we wait with expectancy for that bright morning. It strengthens our hearts, it says at the bottom there, with renewed hope and peace. The waiting does. It strengthens our hearts because we're not waiting idly as we're going to see and it motivates us to work harder well work harder doing what what what's that searching for, god. searching for god okay what else what does the lesson say bringing in what when you plant a crop and you wait you wait what do you wait for harvest, harvest. and what are we harvesting What are we harvesting? <laughs> Souls, yes, thank you. We're called in this waiting period to go out and spread the gospel and bring people in. Bringing in the sheaves, you know that song, bringing in the sheaves. Well, the sheaves are lost people. And so during this waiting period, this expectancy, we have anticipation, we have expectancy, we're to work, we have work to do. We have a busyness to do during this waiting period. 
And so that's what that's all about. It motivates us to work harder bringing in the sheaves of plentiful harvest from the Lord's mission fields, it says. So waiting on the Lord will never put us to shame. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with waiting on the Lord, but we'll rich, be richly rewarded. Why? Because the Lord is faithful to all of his promises. That's what faith is. We claim the promise and we believe he's going to fulfill it, but then we might have to wait. And maybe that waiting is a bit of a testing of our faith, but if we wait, he will and has always come through with his promises. You know, that's what the Ebenezer is all about. If you read in the Bible about the Ebenezer, there's a hymn we sing about the Ebenezer. The Ebenezer was a monument of God coming through. And so we all have Ebenezer's in our life. We can look back. If you keep a journal, you can record these events where God has led in the past. And then when we go back and read those, we, we, our faith is strengthened because we see, oh, God did this for me. God did this for me. God did this for me. And we can review that and be excited. And even in this waiting period, and, you know, we are, I think, general humanity are, uh, is, uh, we are impatient beings. At least I know I am. Okay, so that kind of gives us a, a nice intro to waiting, but we're going to look at this in the, uh, in the Psalms this morning. So go over to Sunday's lesson, page 101. <clears throat> and Kahalia, would you remind me when it gets to 10.15 by getting my attention? Thank you. Otherwise, I'll tend to go overboard here. And uh, <clears throat> this is the call of waiting. And it starts off with our memory verse. So do I have a volunteer who would like to read scripture this morning? And we need a microphone if we don't have one. Yeah, Randy, would you mind grabbing the microphone and spending, passing out to whoever wants to read? Anybody want to read? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Randy. Who would like to read the memory verse? Terry, you want to? Okay, give the microphone to Terry, Randy. And so this starts off our lesson here on uh, the call of waiting. Good morning, Kayla. There you go. Is it working? Wait a minute. Testing. Oh, there we go. There we go. Uh, Member Jack says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Amen. So there's a call from Psalms to wait on the Lord. And what does that waiting do? What does the verse say it does? It says it strengthens our heart. We have good courage. What do you need? Oh, this is next week. Yeah. Sorry, did you uh, need one? Okay. Um, if you need next week, I can get it to you. But I thought I gave you one. Okay, good. All right, uh, wait on the Lord and be of good courage. It takes courage to be patient, doesn't it? Man. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, it takes courage to not get angry. <laughs> it takes strength. It takes uh, the Holy Spirit's power. And so, you know, the question we're actually looking at in this, in this uh, Sunday's lesson is, you know, what do these texts implore God's people to do? And in this one, what does it implore us to do? Wait. Wait and be of good courage. Waiting can be discouraging sometimes, but it says be of good courage. Why? Because God keeps his promises. And we can count on that. He's dependable. His answer may be yes. His answer may be no. But oftentimes his answer is wait. Wait. And we're supposed to wait on the Lord. And what happens when you get ahead of the Lord? Do you remember what happened to King Saul when Samuel told him to wait? And Saul got impatient, and he was like, where is that guy? And got down to the 11th hour. And so he ended up doing the, the service himself, which he was forbidden to do. And he lost his kingdom because of that. He lost his salvation because of that, because he disobeyed the Lord. And so waiting, waiting can be difficult, but be of good courage, it says. Okay, what about Psalm uh, 37? Let's look at that one, Psalm 37. If you turn to your Bibles... Let's go to Psalm 37. I'm going to be reading from the uh, New King James Version. These are some really beautiful verses. So we'll start with verse 7, and then we'll go to 9. And again, the question we're going to look at here is, what are, the, what are these texts in, verse 30, in Psalm 37 implore us to do? What does it implore us to do? So the first one, verse 7, excuse me, says this. 
Rest in the Lord and what? Wait patiently. Wait patiently for him. I think that's speaking directly to me. I, I don't think that applies to you. I think that's just me. <laughs> Mr. Impatient here. Even my wife calls me that. Oh, Mr. Impatient. Do not fret, it says. Why? Because of him who prospers in his way. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. Why? Because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. And then jump down to verse, was it 9? And again it says, For evildoers shall be cut off, but these who wait on the Lord, what happens to them? They shall inherit the earth. What does it say in Matthew chapter 5, verse... I think it's verse 5, Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall what? Inherit the earth. Same line. So meekness, humbleness, patience, long-suffering, all these things are, are important when we're waiting on the Lord, when we're claiming His promises and then waiting. They or we shall inherit the earth. And then jump down to the uh, final verse, verse 34 of that same Psalm 37, verse 34. And it says, um, wait on the Lord. There it is again. And it's not a question. It's not a request. It's a command. Wait on the Lord and keep his way. What do you think his way is? Commandments. His what? Commandments. Commandments, yeah. Obedience. Follow. Jesus says, follow me. That's his way. Go the way he went. And he, God, or Jesus, shall exalt you to inherit the land. Now that's a nice promise. <laughs> that's a wonderful promise. Have you ever had an inheritance where you've inherited something that's valuable? It's a wonderful thing. Well, here God is promising us a, a, an amazingly valuable inheritance. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. That is, you shall see this new land. So again, a beautiful promise in the context of waiting. In the context of waiting. How about Psalm 39, 7? That basically says this. What, uh, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. So again, waiting involves hope. We have this hope. We're looking forward to something. And hope is a wonderful thing. In fact, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit, to have hope. How about Psalm 41? 40 verse 1, I should say. It says, uh, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. So what I read in that is that sometimes we wait, but eventually God hears our cry and he answers that prayer. He might say wait, but at some point down the road, we get an answer. Our son, uh, I don't want to say too much about him, but he, he was a little bit caught up with a, a false prophet. And uh, we tried to chat with him a little bit, but it was clear that our word wasn't of any value at that moment. And so all we could do was pray. We prayed and we fasted for three years. And we were, quite frankly, pretty scared. He was never going to come around. But the Lord said, wait, wait. And at the right moment, the Lord brought around an, an amazing, miraculous event where my son read something that exposed this guy. And finally, that's what convicted him. And it's just amazing transformation of his life. So, you know, God does answer prayers. Sometimes it takes time. And, you know, you, you worry, as a, especially as a parent, you're anxious about your children. Are they going to come back? And then when they do, you feel like, Lord, thank you so much. We wait patiently, it says. Okay, how about Psalm 96.6? There it talks about, let not those who wait for you be ashamed because of me. So sometimes if we're waiting, people will laugh at you. Oh, you believe in this God? He's not going to help you out. He's not doing anything for you. Sometimes we're tempted to think that, or people will say that to us, criticize us. But those who wait for you will be will not uh, you. I'm sorry. Let not those who wait for me be ashamed of me. So there's no shame in waiting. And then finally, Galatians five five. That's a beautiful verse, and it says this. For we, through the Spirit, again, there's the Holy Spirit. That's our powerhouse, remember? That's the engine under the hood for us. Eagerly wait 
for the hope of righteousness by faith. So faith is all about waiting. Waiting and faith are very closely aligned. Um, so our lesson there on um, Sunday says this. It talks about um, one of the greatest stresses in our life is the stress of waiting, right? Sometimes that can be hard. We all at times must wait for things from waiting in line for um, maybe at the store or to waiting or waiting to hear a medical procedure or prognosis. So Wednesday I had to take my wife to the hospital via ambulance and we got to Queens West and uh, they attended to her very quickly, got her in a bed and then we waited and we waited and we waited. <laughs> And then they decided they didn't have the right equipment, so they sent us, sent her to Queens downtown. And we got there, and they got her in a bed in the emergency ward, and we waited, and we waited. She waited all night, and it wasn't until the next morning. And yet, when the next morning came and she had the test, and the t test came back, we were waiting for the prognosis, you know, what's going on? Does she have a blockage in her heart? What's happening here? And it turned out the prognosis was a good one. Yeah, there was some event that happened, but it wasn't as serious as we thought it could have been. So thank you, Lord. But there was a lot of waiting involved. And I only tell that story not to bring attention to myself, but just say, you know, waiting can be frustrating, but if we trust and we have faith and we believe in our Lord's promises, the prognosis will come and the Lord will be uh, with us on in those waiting periods. So I'm just trying to show that in the scripture, it's okay to wait. We, there's plenty, plenty of examples of people waiting on the Lord. But as we mentioned already, there's a work to do while we're waiting. Okay, so going on, it, it, uh, it says something interesting. We wait, which, which we don't always like doing, do we? We don't like waiting. And then ask this question there. What then about waiting for God? What about waiting for God? So it says the notion of waiting for the, on the Lord uh, is found not only in Psalms, but it abounds throughout the Bible, as we already saw. We saw it with uh, Abraham and, and uh, Sarah and Daniel and others. Um, it talks about the operative word here in waiting. What's the operative word in waiting in your lesson? Do you know? Patience. Patience is close. It's related to patience, and it starts with a P. Perseverance, to persevere. Remember, the saints persevere through this world, which requires patience. To persevere, you have to have patience, don't you? When We talked about this uh, at men's group last night. When you get knocked down, you get back up again. That's perseverance. You don't stay down and say, oh, I guess God's given up on me. I guess there's no hope. No, we persevere. We get back up. We put our hand back in his. That is, we repent, we confess, we come back to him again, and we move on with our walk, right? So perseverance is the operative word with regards to waiting. It says perseverance is our supreme commitment of refusing to succumb to fear, the fear, to fear of disappointment that somehow how God will not come through for us. In other words, fear that we might not be able to trust his promises, but we can trust him. And as I said, if you set up these Ebenezer's in your life, you keep a journal of all the amazing miracles that God has done in your life, and then you look back at that, that's going to give you amazing strength with your faith during these waiting times. Um, our lesson goes on to say, God's devoted child, that's us, waits knowing that God is faithful. We know that. And those who wait on him can trust that if we leave our situation to him, we can be sure, the lesson says, that he will work it out, what? For our best. Okay, so sometimes we're worried, we get impatient, we go ahead of the Lord, and then things get really messed up. So I... Uh, when we were missionaries in the Philippines, we were about to leave for furlough. So we had been there three and a half years and hadn't been back to the States, hadn't spoken English a whole lot except right in our household. And uh, of course, we're excited about that, but we're also kind of heavy hearted thinking that, um, you know, what are we going to, is there somebody we can leave to be with the Mungans while we're gone? Well, 
I didn't wait on the Lord in that case. I, I had this idea of somebody who I thought would be really good. So rather than praying about it and putting it before the Lord and waiting for him to provide that person, I jumped ahead, went up and contacted that person, convinced them to come down and be on the project, and it was one of the biggest mistakes I ever made. And it was all because I didn't wait on the Lord. I got impatient. I thought Tony knows best, but Tony didn't know best. It was a, it's a long story, but the point is just that, you know, sometimes we have to trust and wait. And like the story of Saul, when, when Samuel was coming to do the blessing of the, of the army and he couldn't wait any longer, sometimes we have to wait till the 11th hour, the last moment. And there's plenty of biblical examples of that, too. Okay, so waiting on the Lord is more than just hanging on. It is a deep longing for God. It says in our lesson, a deep longing for God. Uh, that, is co that is compared to intense thirst in a dry land. You know, if you're crossing a desert and there's an oasis down there quite a ways away, you're walking towards it. You have a long work, walk, but, but you have this intense thirst for that dry land. And that's what our, that's what our deep longing for God is. Um, it's a yearning to be brought close to, to our God. It surpasses any other desire or need in our lives, it says. And I like this line in the middle of our Sunday's lesson there. It says, God and the whole creation are waiting. So God is waiting, right? All creation is waiting for what? For the renewal of the world. So even God is waiting. He's waiting in his mercy. He's waiting for the whole, as many as we can bring in to know him. He's waiting for people to come into a renewed relationship with him, a renewal of the world, and the blessed meeting of God and his people at the end of time. So he's mercifully delayed his return so that more can come in. And again, our role now that we have a relationship with him is to bring in the sheaves to help with this harvest. So that's a beautiful statement. And then it says uh, in Romans 8, 19, this beautiful statement it says, Paul writes this, for the earnest expectation of the creation, that's what we just talked about, God and all creation, eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God, the sons and daughters of God. That's us. They're all waiting. They're watching and waiting for us to become Christ-like and ready for Jesus to return. So even heaven is waiting, even the angels are waiting, even God himself is waiting. And it says there yet, it says, well, what an incredible promise. Yet while we are waiting for the ultimate salvation and reunion with God, even as, quote, the whole creation groans with labors with, uh, with birth pangs, the Lord still abides with us now through the Holy Spirit. So even though we wait, we still have the Lord with us. He's our companion. That's what the Holy Spirit's all about, our comforter in this waiting period, in this trial period, in this journey through the darkness of this world. And at the bottom of the series, we're called to bear witness to the plan of salvation, <clears throat> which will culminate in the new creation. And then that new creation is ultimately what we are waiting for. We're waiting for the Lord to come back in that new body, that new creation, the earth made new. We're waiting for all of that. And it requires a lot of patience to wait there. Good morning, Brandon. <clears throat> says the final, the new creation, we're waiting for the final fulfillment of our hopes as Adventist Christians. And then it says there, even our name, Adventist, what does that mean? Adventist. What's the Advent? You know, like the Advent calendar? Every Christmas, people get an Advent calendar. It starts December 1st, and you open up a little flap, and it tells you some little nice saying, and you're waiting. What are we waiting for on the Advent calendar? Waiting for December 25th, right? So what does Advent mean? What are we waiting for? Yeah, the return of our Lord. And so even the word Advent implies a waiting period, a time of waiting. <clears throat> so it says even the name Adventist contains the idea of the hope that we w await. We wait, but we know that it's not in vain. Isn't that beautiful? Our wait is not in vain. Christ's death and resurrection, which is going to be celebrated tomorrow, well, uh, actually yesterday and then his resurrection tomorrow, at the first coming is our surety, our assurance, if you will, of his second coming. Okay. We got about 15 minutes before uh, we look forward to hearing Marie's uh, mission story. <coughs> Excuse me.
excuse me. All right, let's all turn to Psalm 131. This is a short psalm, but a really beautiful one. Psalm 131. Oh, and too far. Okay, this is a song of ascents, a song of David, just three verses. And let's just go ahead and read that. And if you don't mind, I'll just read it because we're going to be really short on time. It says, Lord, <clears throat> my heart is not haughty uh, or proud, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul, like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. And verse 3, O Israel, hope in the Lord for this time, from this time forth and forever. Beautiful one. This um, question on this, this uh, verse, this Psalm 131, is what does this psalm teach us about our relationship with God? Okay, and what is that phrase, you know, uh, like a weaned child? What, what are we talking about here? So let's just look at the lesson here, what it's talking about. It talks, it's at the very beginning, there. it says, We live in a world uh, that afflicts the faithful. In other words, it's tough to be a Christian sometimes, right? A world full of temptation and hardship for almost everyone. And it goes on, it says, pride has no value. It causes the proud to become self-centered and unable to look beyond themselves. So pride is one of, the, one of the sins we wanna eliminate from our life. Pride is one of the sources of original sin with Lucifer, remember? So you know, we have to be aware of that. Not to be haughty, as the as the uh, the psalm said, and then it goes on. Uh, second paragraph it says, in contrast, we lift our eyes to God. The acknowledgement of God's greatness makes us humble and free from self-seeking and vain ambition. Self-seeking and vain ambition. If you ever want to read a beautiful chapter, read the thirteenth chapter of First Corinthians. That's the love chapter, but it talks about that. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not rude. Love is not proud. And you know, God is a God of love. We're talking about agape love, selfless love. And so, pride is focused on self, self-centeredness. Whereas, what we're called to do uh, in this psalm is, you know, humble and free from self-seeking and vain ambition. Um, going on, it says, further down, it says, modern science has shown, that, shown us that even the simplest things can be incredibly complicated. It's, that's a really interesting statement right there, because in science, uh, you know, back before they had microscopes, they thought the cell, the human cell, was just this simple little building block of humans and animals and plants. Then they started getting down to the cellular level with very powerful microscopes, and they realized that the cell is one of the most incredibly complex structures in all of nature, and uh, way more complex than they ever imagined or dreamed. And they're continuing to make new discoveries about it, even to this day, how complex our bodies are. Anyways, it says, incredibly complicated, and beyond our understanding. And then it talks about this great irony. What's the great irony? That is, the more we here together to this morning learn about the physical world, the greater the mysteries that appear before us. And what's that got to do with what we're talking about here in the psalm? Well, it goes on to say <coughs> that uh, the metaphor of Psalm 131.2, right? And what was that? That was the weaned child with its mother. The metaphor, that metaphor there is a powerful image of what? of one that's talking about us who finds calmness and who is quieted in the embrace of God. That's what that means, being weaned of, uh, of a mother, the, uh, like a weaned child. Maybe another way to say it is, you know, the, the, the great people, the great people in God's sight are those of deep humiliation. Remember, we said the meek are the ones who inherit the earth. So God is looking for 
greatness in our humility, in our willingness to not look at self, but to look at others, to think of others. So in other words, we are weaned in this psalm. It's talking about how we are weaned away from worldly ambitions and desires and now enjoy security and contentment in God. So we're weaned away from this world. That's what we're trying, God's trying to do. He's trying to get us to don't be proud, don't be ambitious, don't be looking for things in this world. This isn't our home. We're passing through. And so as we pass through, as we gain this appreciation of, you know, I'm just a speck here. God is everything in my life. And I don't need this ambition, this worldly ambition, because it's not going to bring me anything. There's no treasure in it, ultimately. Put our treasures in heaven. And so it talks about, uh, you know, worldly ambitions, desires, and now enjoy security and contentment in God. Look at, uh, well, we read Psalm, we talked about Psalm 5.5, 5, you know, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Look at, let's look at Jeremiah. This is a cool verse. Uh, this isn't in your lesson, but Jeremiah uh, 45, verse 5. If you want to turn your Bibles there, 45 verse 5. And this is in the context of this is, you know, learning to be waiting, but learning to be humble. Good morning, sister. And um, 45 verse 5. And there are only five, five verses in this chapter. It's a very short chapter. 45 verse 5 says this. And do you seek great things for yourself? That's a good question. Do we seek great things for ourselves in this world? Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think there's anything wrong with having uh, appropriate ambition. By appropriate, I mean, you know, you're not climbing over the backs of others. You're not backstabbing. You're not taking advantage of people. You're just putting your head down. You're working hard. Daniel would be a good example of appropriate ambition. He got, kept getting promoted and promoted, but he wasn't gunning for that. They just saw he was trustworthy, and he got these promotions, and he got into higher positions, right? So that's appropriate ambition. But it says, do not seek for thing, great things for yourself. Do not seek them, for behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord. But I will give your life to you as a prize in all places wherever you go. So... Here's a uh, interesting little sort of poet, poetic s sentence, if you will, that's related to this psalm we just, or this uh, Jeremiah verse we just read. Uh, and that is this, uh, nearest the throne itself shall be the footstool of humility. <laughs> Good morning, Marie. Nearest the throne itself shall be so something that's near the throne is the footstool of humility. In other words, when we are humble, when, we're, when we exercise humility in our lives, we don't, we're not doing the self-seeking all the time. We're not striving for the best and the highest in this world. That's when we're closest to the Lord. Remember what Jesus did in the upper room at the Last Supper? What did he do? He washed the disciples' feet, right? He served. And that's what we're talking about here. It says, none, none but the sincerely humble are truly great. So if we want to be great in God's kingdom, it being truly humble, being a true servant for him, giving of ourselves for others, giving of our time, giving of our money, giving of our resources, whatever we have, for the benefit of others, just like Jesus did. I mean, he's our example. Easy peasy there. Okay, so... Um, I just want to reread that, that Psalm 131 in the clear word. I did this last week, too, and I just thought the clear word does a nice job of bringing that Psalm's uh, beauty out. Of course, this is a paraphrase, Jack Blanco's paraphrase of the Bible. But it says this in Psalm 131 from the clear word. The title is Trust in the Lord. Lord, my heart is humbled, and I give up my pride. Isn't that awesome? My heart's humbled and I give up my pride. I willingly give up my pride. I will no longer look down on others. Isn't that nice? Do we tend to look down on people? Yeah, I do. I'm guilty. We will no longer, I will no longer look down on others or preoccupy myself with being great. 
Sounds like this world, doesn't it? Instead, I love this, and this is the part that's like the, the uh, baby being weaned from its mother. Instead, I will be content and at peace with myself, quietly resting in you as a baby rests in his mother's arms or a child secure in his, his or her father's love. And then verse 3 says this, People of Israel, put your hope and trust in the Lord. So I just feel like that really makes that psalm kind of come alive and, and just have real application for us today. Okay, we're going to run out of time here pretty quick, and we're looking forward to hearing from Marie. I want to make sure she has the full half hour at, at least. So jumping over to um, Psalm 126. Uh, let's see, I, I think we have time to read that very quickly. So Psalm 126. <clears throat> uh, that's not it. Okay, let me go further down. Um, yeah, this is just three verses also. So this, Psalm 126 says this, and the question there we're looking at, what gives strength and hope to God's people? What gives strength and hope to us in this world? What gives us strength and hope? And then what can we apply, what in this can we apply to our own lives today? So the psalm says this, when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. So this is talking about when they're captive in Babylon, right? This is the 70-year prophecy of Jeremiah when they're promised to be able to be returned and rebuild Jerusalem. And so that's their hope, their dream. They've been dreaming about this and, and waiting, if you will, which is what our topic is this morning, waiting for that 70-year prophecy to be fulfilled. And so this is this, this joy of knowing that it's near. We are like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter. Why are they laughing? Because they're happy, they're joyful. It's like when we see our Lord coming in the clouds, we're going to be laughing. Lord, you're coming back. We're going to be happy. We're going to be excited. It's going to be a joyful moment. It's the same thing with them. And our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. In other words, he kept his promise. We waited, we waited 70 years, and he kept his promise. Praise the Lord. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as, as the streams in the south. So the south was, you know, this dry desert land, and when it rained, they had lots of good rainfall coming down. So it's a good thing when you're in a desert and you get rainfall. That's wonderful, and that's what they're talking about here. But they're still in captivity here. Bring back our captivity, O Lord. They're still looking forward, but they see that it's close. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. So in this world, we sow in tears. There's a lot of sadness, a lot of heartbreak, a lot of struggle, trial, and difficulty. And then it says, he who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. So that's, again, the, the work we're called to do in this waiting period is sharing what we know about Jesus, sharing the testimonies that what he's done in our lives, these Ebenezers, if you will, with others, to give others hope. Because we were where they were at one time, and we know what that's like, so now we can help encourage them to come where we are now. And that's what it means to bring in the sheaves. Go ahead, sister, you have a question. Can you get her a microphone, please? <clears throat> and then after your question, sis, we're going to have to close because we've got to get our mission story. Yeah, she's over here. Microphone. Yeah, there you go, Randy. Right there. Well, we, we have people online that can't hear you if you don't use the microphone. Thank you, sis. Happy Sabbath, everybody. My Happy name is Sister Sylvia Hudson. I'm new to Hawaii, and I just want to thank everybody for giving me a pillow and blanket and food. Amen. Thank you. Amen. And look, you're here in church. That's so bringing in the sheaves. Praise the Lord. So there's a classic example right there. 
uh, somebody reached out and provided some things for her and she says, okay, I want to come see what these people are like. Are these good people? Are these safe people? Well, that's what we want to be. We want to be representatives of our Lord. Okay, with that I'm going to end because uh, we're so looking forward to this mission story with Marie and I'm going to invite her to come up and I'm sorry we didn't get to finish the lesson. There are some really good par uh, parts there on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, so be sure to read it. And again, if you did not get next quarter's uh, quarterly, come see me. I'll get you one, Marie. I have yours right here with your name on it. <laughs> I didn't forget you. I'll just leave it right there for you. But we're looking forward to this is a mission story of, of uh, Marie's trip to Cambodia. And I believe you have slides and everything for us. Awesome. Can't wait. And then if you want, I'll close at the end with a prayer. Come on up. It's all you. Good morning, church family. Good morning. good morning. It's good to be back <laughs> after a long trip. Um, so I'm doing a mission story and update. And I've been asked for, from a few of our um, church family to share and update the missions in Cambodia that I went to. But before we do that, go ahead and let's go ahead and pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, who reigns on high and reign in us, just want to pause and thank you for the breath of life, for loving us and especially for the great sacrifice you did on the cross so that we now can boldly enter your throne of grace. No more sacrificial animals. You are the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. As I share my mission story, that you will be glorified this is your story working in me. Thank you for giving me the privilege to help those who are in need. May you continue to use me to be a service for you to the sick and the poor. Thank you for hearing my prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Marie Pakleb, and I'm a registered nurse. I got my BSN, um, my ASN in 1991 at University of Hawaii at Manoa, and then my Bachelor's of Nursing in 1992. I've been a nurse for 33 years, and I, I, enjoy, I, I enjoy nursing, period. And when you enjoy something you do, it's really not work at all. Yeah. And you look forward to going to work. People ask me, what kind of nurse are you? Well, right now, I'm a procedure nurse. I work with the interventional radiologist. I sedate or put people to sleep to keep them comfortable and safe while do they do procedure. And what we use is only Versed and Fentanyl, which does a good job. Um, the kind of procedure that they do would be biopsies of bone marrow, liver, kidneys, lung, muscles, whatever it is they need is biopsied. We put G-tube placement, which is a feeding tube. Also port, and the port they use for um, IV antibiotic, IV chemo, uh, when um, they need long-term um, IV access. Also, we put chest tubes in them, biliary tube placement, cystostomy placement, angiograms, fistulograms. So all these interventional radiologists do these things. So my greatest satisfaction is knowing that I help alle alleviate my patient's pain, anxiety, stress, and fear. On Acts 20, 35, I'm going to have you um, share this with you, Acts 20, 35. It says, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this, that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. I have been, I've been volunteering since 1991 with Aloha Medical Mission. Keep forgetting. Um, this is my BSN um, class. See how it shrank really low? So a lot of people didn't go on to get their BSN. And UH was the only nursing school back then. 
Now we have a lot of nursing school because we're so short of nurses. So whoever is interested in going to medical field, I please talk to me. We need good nurses. We really do. Yeah. So Aloha Mecca Mission. We are um, Hawaii based. We've been to Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, and then we've been going two to three times a year. Um, after COVID, we stopped. We weren't allowed to travel. My leader, I'm sorry, was Dr. Carl Lum. He's a retired surgeon. At age 95, he was still doing surgeries. Something minor like hernia repair, that kind of minor lumps and bumps. Nothing big like thyroid. Now this organization is purely volunteer, which means we pay for our own fare, we pay for our own food, we pay for our own accommodation, transportation, and sometimes we're lucky if sponsors would pay for our food and um, hotels. And we've been lucky. So I'm gonna show you some past, um, i sorry, some past mission. So this is my first mission to Laos. So you see these kids, they're very anemic, very frail. This is because of malaria. These people are from the mountain. And they have this large spleen. It takes up almost the whole stomach. And these spleens are not working. Now for hemoglobin, usually normal for children is 11 to 15. These children, their hemoglobin is five and six. They need continuous blood transfusion. So what is the best solution? We did splenectomy. This is removal of the spleen because it's causing more damage than good. Because the spleen is not working properly. See the spleen, the spleen remove healthy, they remove, uh, when the spleen doesn't work properly, it may have to start remove healthy blood cells. So they're not working properly. They, they start removing healthy blood cells and that's why patients get anemic. And it's also important for immune system. And you know what, you can live without a spleen. You didn't need a spleen. So since this, uh, for these children, the spleen was not working properly. It was causing more damage than good and surgeon had to remove it. And they no longer need um, blood transfusion because of that. But also, they have to watch for infection, yeah. This is an enlarged spleen. See how big it is? The spleen is really small but this is an enlarged spleen. It's not working. So this lady, we do a thyroidectomies. This is a thyroid. It comes small, it gets big, depends how long they've had it. So what is, and it's also called a goiter. So what is that? It's an irregular growth of the thyroid. It's just an enlarged thyroid. What is, what is caused? It's usually caused by lack of iodine in your diet. And this is Palawan. So, you know, they have a lot of salt and they have a lot of seaweed. The seaweed is high in iodine. But Dr. Lam said it was from the cassava that they've been eating. They eat a lot of cassavas there. And it caused um, enlarged goiter goiters. Now, what is the function of a thyroid? It produces hormones that regulate the body's metabolic rate and growth and development. So most of the time, these ladies that come in, um, it's cosmetic. Can you imagine living like that? Nobody wants to live like that. And it gets bigger and bigger while it stays in. So we, we remove it. And you know, it's, it's safe to remove it. But you have to have a good surgeon because there's a lot of stuff in there. Trachea, a lot of um, arteries, big arteries. You got the... A lot of stuff there, so it's, it's really a complicated procedure and not all doctors can do that. 
This is Jo. I'll tell you about Jo. She came in for a thyroidectomy. When I got home, I received a, uh, a card from her. And I was surprised. I thought, you know, she'd never um, give me a write to me, but this is what she said. She wrote me a letter, and I know it's hard to read, but what she said is, to my millennium friend, I hope this God will not disturb your work. I hope also that you still remember me. You know what? Before you put the dextrose, which is the IV, in my arm, and before I was outed in the OR, I have a big fear in my heart. But because of your sweet smile, my fear was all gone. I can't forget your sweet smile, the smile that really attracted me so much that until now I always want to see. This is the first time I felt like this. Every time you smile there in a the hospital, as if I could fly. I don't know why. I keep asking myself why. I hope you were not angry. I'm just telling the truth. I'll be happy if you will answer the letter to me. I wish I could always carry your smile in my heart. Amen. So just a little smile wherever you go. You don't know what people are going through. You, they may look really good and outside they're happy, but you don't know what's inside. Because she looked like she had no problem. She didn't, she didn't act like she was stressed. But I didn't know what, what she was feeling. And I didn't know I made a big impact on her. Just, just a little smile makes a big impact in people. And you know, um, sometimes people come into the hospital, they're angry, angry, angry. They said, I'm forced to do this. This is one guy came in to IR. I'm forced to do this procedure. I said, you're not forced to do anything. You can leave right now. You're not forced to do anything. I said, yes, the doctor told me I have to do it. Well, go back to the doctor. Tell me you don't want to do it. You're not forced to. So he gave us a hard time. But in the end, he was very appreciative. Yeah, just calming people and just, just, just being kind. That's about it. Just being kind, because we don't know what people go through. Yeah. You see, this is another goiter. So this lady, she come in. She has uh, three children, and uh, they have cleft lip and palate. And she was so kind, um, she was so appreciative that she invited us to her house. Now, think about it, you're poor, you go to someone else, you don't expect a big, beautiful house. When we came to her house, she has two rooms. Her house, um, her floor is made of dung. She has a few benches, a bed with all the kids and their, their mom and dad. No bathroom in the house. No running water in the house. No electricity in the house. She cooks outside and she goes to the river and fetch water. That's a hard life. But you know what? She was still happy. Yeah. She was still happy. And she, even though so little that she had, she gave us fruits. And she knew we wouldn't, we wouldn't take the water or anything, but she gave us fruits, bananas, and anything that we could peel, oranges. Anyway, what uh, cleft lip and palate? They say, what is that caused by? Um, according to the doctors, they said it's prenatal care. You know, they, they, they don't have folic acid in there and all these vitamins that they take prenatally. And usually, they really don't know. Yeah. Also, uh, to prevent also cleft lip and palate, you need to avoid alcohol during pregnancy and, you know, getting a healthy weight and protect yourself from infection. So this is pre and post cleft lips. They make a lot of difference in someone's life. I had a young man who came in. He had his hood over his face. 
and it was a, like he would not lift his head. And I said, "What's?" And I asked my friend, "What's wrong with that guy?" I said, "I don't know." So let's 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 talk to these local people. What's what's wrong with him? You know? He said, "Well, when he was a young kid, people called him monster because he has a cleft lip. All his life, he was called a monster." Can you imagine that, as a child growing up, being called a monster? So he was, he never, um, you know, let us see what he looked like. And of course we, we you know, we, our privacy, we respect his privacy. So when he went to the OR, he did his surgery, we still respected his privacy, we never took pictures of him. When the next year we went back, got a girlfriend. <laughs> Next year after that, he got married. You know, that's changed life, yeah? That awesome God is, yeah. This is Chapa. So I went to Cambodia, was that in February? And this is another type of mission, um, another organization. And Chapa. CHAPA stands for Cambodian Health Professionals Association of America. This is Dr. Sang. He's our leader for this group. He's our pediatrician. He survived the concentration camp in Cambodia during the Khmer Rouge time. If you don't know what the Khmer Rouge, look it up. Yeah. It was 1975 to 1999. It was led by Pol Pot. And if there's a movie on it, The Killing Field. You look at it, you watch it. It's horrible. It's like Holocaust. Yeah. They, most people did not survive the concentration camp. And a lot of people were trying to flee to Thailand. Um, so, but he did. He, he survived that and he became a pediatrician. Now he leads this Cambodian trip because he feels for his people. You know, these people, if you, if you don't have medication, you don't have insurance, you don't have money, you just live with it. You know what I mean? You just live with it. Because you don't have money to pay, to see, even to see a doctor, to, to even see a dentist. That's how they're poor they are. So this is our, um, our intake room, and we had a lot of people all over creation, just waiting to see the doctor. So the medical team saw 5,637 patients. The dental group, they extracted 1,100 tooth, young and old. They also filled teeth, 36 patients, they're filling teeth, and 52 patients, they cleaned their teeth. Now this is pre-op, and most of the time, you know when you're in a hospital, when you, when you go surgery, you have a bed, you have a television, you have a warm blanket, right? So lucky, most of the time you have, a, you come to Queens, we have a warm blanket, we have television, you got soft, comfortable bed, these people, look what they're doing. Pre-op, they're sitting on the chair with the IV. People waiting, other people waiting for the, no, there's no privacy. But they're there because this is the only chance they can see a doctor or, or have surgery. Otherwise, nothing, no surgery. So we're quite spoiled in America, right? And we should be more grateful. People complain because they waited too long, 30 minutes, an hour. What's going on? You know, they demand and command. But you, they don't realize how other people, what they go through, and they don't think themselves very fortunate, but privileged. So this is a pre op room. And when we went to this hospital, most mission hospitals actually, it's like mesh. You go in, it's filthy. Because the only time they use it is on missions. 
So this room, we had to actually clean it up. Wash the walls, clean the floor, put the beds in there, um, put our machine, we bring everything with us. Blood, uh, the monitors, medications, um, drapes, everything we bring with us. Surgery. We had a lot of surgery. 141 surgery in, one, in five days. That's a lot. Ophthalmology saw 271. They did 40 cataract surgery. Seven pterygium. It's that, that uh, clouding thing in the eye. They take it out so you can see. Otherwise, if it gets bigger, you, you can't see. And then they did laser, for laser. So we were busy. And a lot of them were, uh, we had minor lumps and bumps. But also we had a lot of general surgery. So all kids were general surgery. We had totally put them up, put a breathing tube, put them on a breathing machine. Yeah. Because there's no way this kid can keep still. <laughs> they come in, they're crying, they're hungry, they're scared. So they usually be the first one to do surgery. And can you imagine putting IVs in crying kids? It is a challenge. So with the stuffed animals that you gave me, it works beautifully. Yes, amen, thank you so much for that. There's another, um, uh, the most busiest doctor there was the OBGYN. Now these ladies, they, they see midwives when they give delivery, but they don't see the doctor. So that's probably the first time they're seeing a doctor. And a lot of them have, um, it's called fibroid, myomectomy, we remove it. Now I'll have some pictures of it. This is a minor lumps and bumps. This kid here, it's amazing, this kid here, oh. This here, first day I saw her running around. She wanted stuffed animals, so one of my friends gave her stuffed animal. I said, that's fine, go ahead, you can give it to her. The next day I saw her again, I was like, what, this kid don't go to school or something? The next day I saw her again, I was like, all day long he's in the hospital, I said, what is this? How come she's here? It's like, oh, she lives here. I said, what do you mean she lives here? Her mom is in a hospital. And when her mom is in a hospital, the whole family is in a hospital. But you know who cares for the patient? It's the family. The family brings food. The family brings clothing. The family takes them to the bathroom. The family washes them up. The family takes care of the patient. And when they're vomiting, the family's there with that basin. Nur nurses do not take care of the patient. The nurses in this country, all they do is give medication. Can you imagine that? They put on the bedpan, they do everything for the family. Now most of the time we Americans drop off the family and then come and see them now and then and then, hey, how come you do this? How come you do it? You know what I mean? But it's actually this family is the one taking care of this, of this patient and their loved ones. Hard to grasp, yeah? Yeah. So this is a little girl. She has, um, see her eyelid kind of droopy? We did a blepharoplasty on her. And you see her stuffed animals, you know, cute? And so when she had her surgery, she came out, I had to show this to you. Do you see her eyes? Oh wait, sorry. You see her eyes, she had a patch, and so that's a, doll had a patch. The surgeon put a patch over the eye too. Isn't that cute? I thought that was, it was really cute. <laughs> they call it the fluplasty. Yeah. Okay, this girl, she had a, a myomectomy, which is, she has an enlarged um, hemorrhoid. She's been trying to get pregnant for years and years. Um, because of the hemorrhoid, she couldn't. So she had her surgery. And bad news, the doctor told her, I don't think you're gonna have any babies. 
because you have too much adhesion in, in the uterus. So she started to cry. Because they've been trying to have a baby for two, three years now since they've been married. And you know, women, you know what that feels. When you can't have a child and you want it so badly, you don't know how it feels not having that. And she, she was crying. So my friend told me, hey, Maria, I need a stuffed animal. I said, for what? I said, adult or a child? For an adult. I said, this is only for children, it's not adult. I said, no, Marie, this is, she really needs a stuffed animal. She said, oh. she said okay. Okay, go find one. So she, she got this one, and I went to give it to her. And she started to cry more. We told her, maybe this represents some kind of hope in your life. Maybe there's some hope and never give up. That's all we could do, yeah? But she was appreciative, yeah. See this kid here? Actually, this, uh, this kid here. She came into my pre-op room crying. I was like, what is going on? She's like tears, I'm like crying, crying. And I was like, what's the mother? I said, we don't know it's the mother. I said, can you ask her, because these people don't speak English. Ask her what's going on. She said, oh, I just went to see the doctor and they told me to come to surgery. And she, so she's so afraid. Because she was just, went there and I'm like, she's sitting there. And I said, I said well, um, we told her, well, you know there's a lump in your head, yeah? And we're going to make you more beautiful. We're going to take it out. Yeah. So this is called lipoma. Lipoma could be anywhere in your body. It's a, just a fatty tissue. It doesn't hurt. Um, sometimes it does hurt, depends where it is. But it's not, um, it can't kill you. <laughs> yeah, it can't kill you. And so we had, uh, they had taken it out. And that's her now, she's so happy. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I got, what time do I have? <laughs> anyway, so this lady here, after lunch, I was going back to work, and I saw this lady sitting, sitting on a bench. And as I go closer, I've, I smell some odor, like foul odor. And I went closer, I saw the drape over her face, and she had flies on it. I said, she, what's going on? And, um, so she opened it, and it was just alarming. So if you guys have crazy stomach, just close your eyes, okay? But this is what life is, you know, and you will see this. Anyway, so we gave our stuffed animal, and it gave so much joy, so much joy. And that's how she is. So what happened is, she's very poor, okay? Think about it, she's very poor. She can't afford anything. That's the skin cancer. That's just advanced. To, for someone to, to have that, it's like she has penniless. She has nothing. But she came too late. We can't do nothing. So what we did is we did a biopsy on that. And uh, I asked one of the doctors, hey, is there a way we can, we can help her? Maybe clean it and put a graft over her face. They said, we can't do it here because we don't have um, you know, the manpower. We don't have the utilities to do that. Yeah. So but we're going to send them to uh, Sam Reap. And we're going to send them to the hospital. And they're gonna, what they're going to do is they're going to clean the area and they put a, put a skin graft over her face so it's not exposed like that. Yeah. And uh, CHAPA will pay for everything. So that's what we do. When we can't do something about it, and someone else can in a bigger hospital uh, with better equipment, then we pay as an organization for their surgery, for their recovery, and for their medication. Yeah. There's just a few, oh, few kids who stuff animals. Um, this kid was so good, put in the IV, no problem. She was so brave. Here's another one.
Here's another one. This is all just, I just wanted to take pictures of all the kids that had stuffed animals, just to share it with you guys, that it did, it went to a good cause, yeah? Yeah, these guys, a lot of kid there. Of course, uh, this medical students, Cambodian medical students also wanted to stuff animals, so I had to give it them too, because they work really hard interpreting and everything. <laughs> and then um, more kids. Yeah. They just loved it. It made a whole lot of difference. And then and then after the end of our mission, I had a lot of, I had a few stuffed animal left. So I took it and, and gave it away to the, the staff and the family. They all came, I said, we want, everybody want one. <laughs> oh, everybody want one. This is the ground of the hospital. Actually, people put up tent in a hospital because they have to stay while the family is recovering because they're taking care of the family, yeah? Yeah. That's it. Thank you so much for everything. And I leave you with this Matthew 25, 37. Matthew 25, 37. Matthew. Okay, here, here. 37. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Amen. Were you blessed? Amen. These mission stories are pretty amazing, very powerful. If you ever get a chance to go on a mission, please uh, take advantage of it. Uh, my son is in the Philippines right now doing a medical mission and sending pictures and similar. And we were missionaries amongst the tribal group, uh, very poor, poorest of the poor, with all kinds of diseases and in large spleens, like she said. And it does. It takes up almost the whole stomach there. So it uh, can be pretty heartbreaking, but it also can be extremely joyful when you reach out to some of these incredibly needy people of the world. So thank you, Murray, for sharing. That was really awesome. It was, uh, I could have had you go on and on and on. I, I loved it. So it brings back beautiful memories. But um, let's just close with prayer, our Sabbath school class, and then we'll go on to our worship service. Father in heaven, you have been such an amazing and gracious God. And you see, Lord, the suffering in this world. And I'm just so thankful for people like Marie and others who are willing to go over and sacrifice their time and their resources to bring some comfort and joy to the very poorest of the poor in this world. And to see their happy faces just bring such warmth to our hearts, Lord. So open up opportunities if there's a chance for any of us to go out likewise to bring this kind of joy to others. And that's what mission's all about, is bringing joy to those who are joyless, who don't know the truth, and who are searching. And Lord, we thank you too for the Sabbath school lesson that we went through on waiting on the Lord. That we, uh, it's evidence of our hope, looking forward to the second coming of Jesus. And we ask you to be with us this day as we continue with our worship service. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, and we'll start our worship service very soon. <clears throat>
Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. Oh, that was a little weak. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Amen. <laughs> Are you glad to be in the house of the Amen. Lord? Amen. Amen. I'm not on. I'm on. It's so, okay. We're going to start our praise songs. Please sing with us. And 
later on for our special music. Our special music person is ill, so we're going to sing together as a congregation, okay? So please um, warm up your pipes now with our <laughs> praise songs and sing along with us. <laughs> 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 Okay. okay. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, let us open up with a word of yeah. prayer. Yeah. Father in heaven, Lord, happy Sabbath. Um, Father, we just thank you so much for this beautiful day of rest that you've given to us and that we get to fellowship with each other. So we ask for your angels to sing with us and your Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts and our minds, Lord, as we worship and praise you. And as we think about what this weekend, as the world celebrates, what it truly means, we are so thankful for the gift of salvation. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 is family of God. No longer an outcast, a 
new song I sing. From rags on to riches, from the weak to the strong, I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God. of him we have such a blessed family so let's sing our last song for this morning uh, I love you Lord <laughs> right thank you so much ladies can you turn that up a little bit there we go that's better well welcome welcome and happy sabbath all we're a little bit thin ranks here today but uh i guess i would have to trust that, that means that we have a lot of people joining us on youtube so that's good and we're going to be uh olelo <laughs> did i say it right this time <laughs> here soon, so we'll be looking forward to the uh, TV station Olelo joining us, or us joining them, I suppose. Well, it's a beautiful Sabbath day, as we said in Sabbath school class, summer's coming, nights are getting a little bit warmer, days are getting warmer, and uh, it's beautiful out there. Uh, I want you to notice the uh, magnificent decorations we have here. Very, very beautiful. I am really impressed. Sarah, thank you so much. God bless. And uh, in, in honor of our Lord, who is uh, now sleeping in the tomb, in history, of course, and, uh, but then tomorrow is going to be uh, resurrected and then ascending. And of course, we know he's already on his throne, and we're looking forward to his soon return. But to remember that moment is a really important uh, event that uh, brings joy to our hearts. I um, also want to welcome any visitors that we might have here this morning, and just please know that we do have a, a potluck here, and we are looking forward to a spiritual feeding through Brother Perry, and then a physical feeding through uh, our potluck, so please stick around for that as well. Um, also, I'd like to ask you to all pray for Pastor Ron and his wife Vanessa, our pastoral team, because they are in Molokai today. 
And uh, I'm just excited to announce, I don't know how many of you know this, but our church has decided to uh, create a fund in our budget called Molokai Malama. And that fund is specifically to assist Pastor Ron and his wife Vanessa with, and Brandon and the rest of the family there with outreach and support and help for our new sister church of Molokai. And furthermore, and this gets even more exciting, uh, Wahiwa has done exactly the same thing. So Wahiwa is our new sister church, and the two of us are joining forces together to also welcome Molokai. And this fund is called Molokai Malama. And so you can actually give money, specifically if you want to, on your tithe envelope to Molokai Malama, and that will go to help offset costs for the plane ticket for various people to fly over. For example, I'll be flying over in April to do a sermon there, and, um, and I would therefore be eligible to be reimbursed from this fund for my plane ticket. My wife's gonna go with me. She's not eligible because the rule we passed was it would be covering one person only. And then we also talked about possibly sending over maybe women's ministry going over and doing some outreach, helping offset some of their fare, as well as maybe uh, some men, maybe remnant men, or maybe uh, other people going over to do um, a work be there. And again, have this money to offset that. And then we're talking about doing fundraisers to bring money into that fund to continue this work to help uh, to be kind of partnership with Wahiwa, with Pastor Ron and Vanessa in outreach to Molokai. Um, I have worked on Molokai many, many times. My job with USDA took me to uh, what was called the Plant Materials Center, which is right there by the airport. And I was in charge of that. And so I got to make a lot of trips over there. It's a great island. It's got about 8,000 people and about 75,000 deer. <laughs> So they're a little bit overrun with deer. So if you like venison, uh, go over and you can eat as much venison as you want. No, but it's a beautiful place, dry on the west side, uh, wet and mountainous on the east side, but a gorgeous, gorgeous island. Welcome visitors, good to have you here this morning. So anyway, so keep that in mind. Molokai Malama, uh, a special fund that Wahiwa and Wai and I have set up to help reach out to uh, our, our new sister church, Molokai. In your announcements, you're going to see uh, Adventist Malama Elementary School is having, it has committed to doing the potluck every first Sabbath of each month, which is really awesome. They're going to take full responsibility for it, set up, serving, cleanup, and they're going to be doing haystacks every single first Sabbath of the month. So that's pretty exciting. Now, when I became a Seventh Day Adventist, I heard all these people talking about haystacks. I thought, what are you people talking about haystacks? <laughs> I had no no idea what a haystack was. Well, you know, it's a fancy name for a taco salad, but really good. And so we look forward next week to uh, enjoying the first of uh, uh, monthly haystacks served to us by our Ames staff. And we just want to say thank you to them, uh, hard work that they do with our school here. There is a social committee meeting today uh, in the kindergarten room, and uh, Ivory is our social committee leader, and so um, she'll be leading that meeting. If you're part of the social committee, please plan to attend that. Grab your, your meal, your potluck meal, and then go into that, um, the kindergarten room. It does say there's a personnel, personal ministry meeting, but I don't believe uh, Faith is here. I think she's in Samoa. So I'm not sure there is a meeting today, but uh, if she happens to show up, that'll be in the pastor's office today. I think we just forgot to take that off the calendar. But anyway, personal ministries, when she returns, she and her husband uh, uh, had to go back to Samoa to take care of their, their, their house there. It was having some issues, and I think they're gonna be gone for about a month, but anyway. And then finally, the last announcement I wanna make here this morning before we go to our worship service, which is the reason we're here, of course, is if you have a child in our Ames school, or if you know a parent who has a child from our church in the Ames school, tomorrow is a very, very important deadline, and that's tomorrow. And that is the multi-scholarship deadline. So in order to be eligible for your child to have the, uh, 
the, the scholarship offered by our church, which is going to have a meeting on, I believe, April 4th, then you have to also apply for the other scholarships as well. If you fail to apply for those, you won't be ineligible for the one from our church. And that's just because we want to have everybody take advantage of all the opportunities that are out there in addition to what the church here can provide. This church has been very, very generous towards our members' students in our AIM school, and we want to try to continue that generosity to the degree that we're able, but we also expect the parents of those students to likewise do their part and try to bring in as many scholarship dollars as they possibly can. And so these sheets are available. It gives you all the details out there in the lobby. Again, if you don't have kids there, but you know somebody who does, please grab one and get this in their hands by tomorrow, if possible, because tomorrow is indeed the deadline. With that, we will go to our call to worship, the whole reason we're here. And Brother Perry, we're so looking forward to the Lord's message being delivered through you. And uh, let us have our hearts ready for that message that we can be changed by it. So if you'll open your Bibles to Psalm number 92. Psalm number 92, it says verses 1 and 2. I'm going to read 1, 2, and 4, if you don't mind. Verses 1, 2, and 4. I read 4, I thought, well, that's a nice verse, too. So verses 1, 2, and 4 of Psalm 92. And this is called Praise for the Lord's Goodness. We serve a good God, don't we? God is good all the time. And that's what this psalm is all about. God is good. And it says this, verse 1, It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. Verse 2, To declare your, that is God's, loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night. And then verse 4, For you, O Lord, have made me glad by what you have done. Amen. I will sing for joy at the works of your hands. And may Jesus, our Lord, add a blessing to these words, and we look forward to worshiping our God this morning. Thank you, and, the, and a happy Sabbath to all. May the congregation please rise. kind, loving Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we humbly come before you this morning, and we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Please remove any distractions, Lord, that will take our minds and our hearts away from hearing your voice today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Morning, everybody. Have Sabbath. I have a reading, um, and it says, I remember it like it was yesterday. I got a call from a close friend saying that they had gotten an incredible job in an incredible city that would be their dream come true. I celebrated with my friend while also feeling the sting of my pain from my own disappointment from recently being rejected from yet another job for which I was qualified, yet was not found worthy to possess. Disappointment and rejection can be hard things to deal with. One thing that God taught me and my family during that season of our lives was that though it may not be my turn for the blessings of my dream job, it is always my turn to serve God and those around me by doing my best, no matter what position I'm in. One thing that has blessed me and many others during tough times is the support local churches offer to those who are struggling just to make it. I've been in small group Bible study where other members prayed for me and supported me in my ways, both with physical needs and spiritual. Today's offering will go to support our one Eye Church budget, which supports ministries that are the heartbeat of our church all week long, not just on Sabbath. The Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive, Acts 20, verse 35. Okay, um, will the deacon please rise? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you very much for this blessed Sabbath day. Thank you very much for the message. Thank you very much for everything that you have blessed us with. Our home, our shelter, providing food on our table. Lord Jesus, I pray that you please help us to give everything from our heart so that the money will be used for this purpose, for our church budget, for our one Eye church. You've done so much for us, I ask that you please help us to give back where it belongs to you. Bless the money to further your work so that others may see the blessings as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Sabbath Church. So um, today we're going to do a little something different. I think the cakeies will be telling the story. So 
Um, Ellie's going to open us with a prayer, Ellie. Close your eyes. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, for this day. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Jesus, Jesus, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ellie. And then um, Eden and Hevani is going to sing a song of the story of a man that we're talking about today. And then KJ is going to tell everyone the story about this man. Zacchaeus is a wee little man, and a wee little man he was. He climbed up in a sycamore tree to see the Lord. Something, something, something. I don't know. <laughs> you didn't tell me you didn't know the song. I don't know the song. <laughs> But KJ, hopefully KJ, sorry church, hopefully KJ will share the rest of the story that continue the play in the song. Okay. Thank you, KJ. <laughs> and I sit down. Okay. Okay, um, so Zacchaeus was a, was a tax collector and he cheated on everyone. And people didn't like Zacchaeus. And then Jesus came to town. Everyone gathered around to see Jesus. And Zacchaeus wanted to see, Je wanted to see Jesus. But he couldn't, because he, he was too short. And so he saw a sycamore tree. And then he climbed the sycamore tree to see Jesus. And then when Jesus came, Jesus said, Zacchaeus, Come down from the tree, for I'm going to your house today. Amen. And everyone was was shocked. <laughs> um, and and Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus said, "I will I will give the money that I cheated on everyone back to the poor." I will pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you that we're all here and that uh, help us to learn more. Right. Help us to make good choices and that we can learn more about you. And thank you, Jesus. Amen. And this offering goes to support our scholarship fund for the students at Ames.
morning, everybody, and a happy Sabbath. <laughs> right now, it's time for our garden of prayer. For those who are able to kneel, please do so. If you're not, you can remain seated. Shall we bow our heads and close our eyes? Father, we turn in heaven, Lord Jesus. Good morning to you, Lord Jesus, and happy Sabbath to you, Lord. We're inviting you this morning to come here and to be among us, Lord, and also the Holy Spirit to be present to Lord. And Lord, we need of you daily in our life. For without you, we are lost, Lord. You know that there is a need in Wayne and I. You can see everyone's heart, Lord. For those present here and those at home also and on YouTube. Whatever the requests are or the prayer that they have, may we reach their heart and touch them and heal them, Lord. Like also we touch as we prepare for your surgery, may be with him. Comfort him and assure him that you have everything in control, that we have nothing to worry about. And also, be also with Mary Pakleb. And also, all those out there, Lord Jesus, who are not here, like Cynthia, be with her too, Lord. And Even those, Lord Jesus, that are out there who've been praying and asking you for help. I know you can hear that prayer, Lord. And also, Lord Jesus, I pray today that you will be with the messenger this morning, Uncle Perry, as he delivered the message that you prepared for us. Help us to be ready to receive that message and to be oh, in our heart, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your kindness, your patience, and your long suffering, and your love towards us. Help us to always be faithful to you, Lord. Help us to swear in our will daily to you. Lord Jesus, thank you for your blessings. We ask all these things, we leave everything in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading is in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Okay. And it reads, All these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the heavens, I mean, excuse me, of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. May God add his blessings to his words. Okay, good morning, church family. <laughs> um, we don't have special music, so we're all going to sing today. If you Amen. can, uh, I don't know if it's on the screen, but if you have a hymnal in front of you, it's page 537. 
Okay. He leadeth me. Sabbath. If I could get someone to please uh, take these mics down on this side for me, please. Someone once told me that, um, someone very knowledgeable, very told me that I was a wanderer as I speak. So, all right. What do we have to do here? Oh, cool. How was everyone's week? Blessed? Well, irregardless of how your week was, we are blessed because we're here this morning. We're alive this morning. We have breath this morning. Yeah, sometimes we take that for granted. Um, repeat after me. No prayer, no, prayer. no, power. no power, 
A little prayer. A little, a little power. Much prayer. Much power. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you know how this message is meant to unfold. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit remove me, Lord, from this message. Everything must be in line with your will. If it is not, Lord, I ask you to take it from my memory, take it from my voice, and let the people only hear and understand what they need to, Lord, for today. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for loving me more than I deserve. Lord, I don't belong here, Lord, but yet you still can use me. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, this message... I know, I, I talk loud. I, uh, so this message started with a friend of mine and she, so this friend, we, I grew up with this person. We went to the same Seventh-day Adventist school. We went to the same Seventh-day Adventist church. Like Hanabara days, we grew up together, right? There was no, she knew our, my faith and I knew her faith because it was the same faith. Well, as it happens, you know, the world sometimes takes us in a different direction. And as we grew older, she asked me recently, how come you, guys, how come you don't visit other churches? And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, I go to IAEA church once in a while. I go to Kaneohe church once in a while. But that's not what she meant. She was asking why I don't visit other non-Seventh-day Adventist churches, which struck me because we grew up together. Why would she ask me something like that? Knowing, knowing our faith, our shared faith, why would she ask me for that? So that was one question that, that took me by surprise. And then it was, well, why would she ask that? What is, what is the attraction for her? Okay. So that was the beginning of this message, which started uh, the beginning of this month. And normally it takes me a little bit, a little while to get a message going. But for some reason, this message came together fairly quickly within about two weeks or so. And I was like, oh, wow, awesome. You know, I have an extra two weeks to practice. Well, the last two weeks of mine have been extremely stressful. The kind of stress where you wake up at one in the morning in a cold sweat. The kind of stress where you wake up in the middle of the night and you're leaning off your bed and your head is in your hands and you're, you're trying to look for answers. You find yourself wandering around your house in the middle of the night because you just can't sleep. That kind of stress. And God knew that. He said, you know, I got to give this message to Perry the first two weeks of March because the second two weeks of March aren't going to be that great for him. But praise the Lord, I have you folks. I have friends and family within this church, specifically, and forgive me for mentioning, but Daniel and Cece, Tony and Cynthia, and my wife, who helped me through this process. So thank you guys. So everything you want right now. So the questions that I wanted to answer, or at least try to understand was, why did my friend suggest that I visit other non-Seventh-day Adventist churches? And what was the attraction for her? My opinion, now my opinion, was worldly stimulation. So disclaimer, I am a very sinful person. And because of that fact, it's imperative it's imperative you study God's word for yourself. Don't take the word of anybody who just stands up here just because they have a Bible in their hand or dress nicely that everything that comes out of their mouth is truth. God wants us to live in the world but not the world in us. So because of that, study God's word for yourself. If that's all you take away from this message today, understand that. Why? Because one day, 
Like for me, this past week, the world will challenge you in your faith and your belief in God. Then what are you going to say? What are you going to do then? Oh wait, let me uh, phone a friend real quick. Let me, uh, let me call Tony. He's got the answer for you. Then you can talk to him and you can ex he can explain to you why we need the seventh day, why we need the Sabbath off. What are you going to do when you are put in that corner and you are questioned? What are you going to say? Our scripture reading today from 2 Timothy. Let's focus a little bit on verse 15. It says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is our society today. We want it now. We don't care. And if we don't get it, we end up like this little child on the other side. That's the society we live in. That's the world we live in. And if you guys know where this picture on the left came from, you guys are just as old as I am. Right? And wives, don't be looking at your husbands to the, about the picture on your right, okay? We're not all that bad. So, but that's our society today. Today's society demands fast service, not from others, of course, not from uh, myself, but I expect it from you. We expect when you call someone that they pick up the phone right away. So what do you mean the phone rang three times? You screening your calls? You don't want to answer my call? What's wrong? What's wrong with you? Right? Today's society expects faster download speeds. Society wants to watch their TV shows on demand. And they expect to be entertained. Because if we're not entertained, I'm going to leave you a bad review. I'm going to write something bad about you. Today's society expects to be first in line, and if not, what is taking so long? Uh, even if I'm not first in line, I better be in front of you. Today's society, we have drive-through marriages. We even have one-minute rice, and, and I'm guilty of that. I, I, like, I love my one-minute rice because it's quick. But that's what we live in. We, are, we want things right now, right, right now. Forbes magazine, and Cece, you're an advertisement. You should understand some of this. So back in 2017, Forbes magazine says, impatience is a virtue. This just might be the mantra for today's connected consumer. We live in an on-demand economy where with just a few taps and swipes or what have you, we can get what we want, instant gratification. Right? We are right now consumers. When I grew up on Kauai, I would order parts from my truck and the guy at the counter would say, hey, it'll be in in about two months. And I'd be like, okay, cool, two months. He would call me at about the month and a half mark and say, hey, your, your parts are in. I'd be like, yes, this is amazing, a month and a half. Nowadays with Amazon Prime, if we don't get it in two days, man, I'm calling somebody, <laughs> right? It's not the consumer's fault. We didn't expect to set out this way. It just happened to be that way with the society, the society we live in. So for better or for worse, this influenced consumer behavior beyond the point of no return. Cece, I don't know how you do it in advertisement, how you can reach people in a godly way, yet still reach, reach your audience, which is in the world. I couldn't even begin to understand that. Some in today's society, having been now conditioned with this on-demand attitude, why wouldn't they expect the same thing from a church service? Right? I want the best parking when I come. I want the best seat in the sanctuary. And I expect to be entertained before this guy starts talking. And it better be quick and simple because I got someplace else to be. You guys know what hyperbolic discounting is? Hyperbolic discounting is what happens when we have the choice between a reward now or a reward later. We want the reward now. Even if the reward later gives us a little bit more, it doesn't matter, I want it now. Hyperbolic discounting is why we expect so much higher reward if I have to wait for something. It better be good. Sorry, let me rewind this a little bit. Okay. Oh, 
what's going on here. You guys hear me? So what this is, is a man who's petting his dog, right? He's saying how relaxing petting your dog is, right? He's saying how nice and um, relaxing it is and the dogs like it and clearly there's some issues here, right? Now, I, I can tell you personally, the, the, the dog, if the dog really wanted to get away, he'd be squirming a lot more, right? So this is kind of a, it's kind of a, it's kind of a joke. Right. But that's stimulus. So if you folks were just about getting comfortable in your pew, the AC is hitting you just right, getting comfortable, then you saw, oh, there's a, there's a video on. Hmm. You wake up a little bit more. And if this worked properly, you would hear his voice, you'd hear the dog barking and stuff, right? You'd pep up a little bit more. That's stimulus, right? A stimulus is anything that causes you to react, right? For example, we're gonna have potluck here, right? When you, you go into the kitchen, you're gonna smell Tusi cooking. Your mouth might begin to water. Just like when you saw this video, right? You pepped up a little bit more, stimulus. So what does all this have to do with church? My questions were, were, why are our pews not overflowing with youth and young adults? Where are our new members? Because for some, instead of being stimulated and satisfied by God's word and his truth, Satan is pulling their eyes, their hearts and their minds away from God and toward the world and its glitz and its glamour. So, while putting this together, I had, I had a bunch of Ellen White's writings in front of me, and I, put this, I wrote this down and I didn't get the reference. And so I apologize for that. So if, if you folks know where I got this from, please let me know so I can add it to the PowerPoint. Um, because I, I don't want you guys to think that, okay, I'm just typing something in here and everything I put up there, you guys are supposed to automatically swallow as truth, right? It has to be backed up with the Bible, period. Ellen White, okay, so the local church is called to exist for a purpose. It is, of, it is of biblical concern to address whether our local gatherings are fulfilling their purpose. Is YNI Seventh-day Adventist Church fulfilling our purpose? While size can be a challenge, whether too big or too small, the more important concern of the church leader should be its effectiveness and fulfilling the purchase, uh, purpose. Large churches are not unbiblical in and of themselves. Large churches can be a great example of biblical church body. The Bible never demands or expects a certain size for a gathering. However, it is crucial, no matter the size of the church, whether we have five people like we may have in Molokai, 50 people, 100 people, or 5,000 people, to examine its obedience to biblical commands. Period. Doesn't matter what the person up here is saying, if it's, if it's unbiblical, don't believe it. So, from our um, 70 Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's do a little deep dive into that. Put them into remembrance. A knowledge of their privilege and duties. Do you have a knowledge of your privilege and a duty. Do you know that? Do you have a pri you're, We are privileged to be alive this morning. We have an opportunity to go out and witness out there to other people. To fortify against profitless disputes and erroneous errors. Teachings. How are you going to know what is er an erroneous teaching if you don't know for yourself? To study, to exert oneself, to exert, putting some effort into studying, to be diligent. 
rightly dividing, literally cutting straight. The truths of the Bible must be rightly interpreted so that no part of the scripture will be set in opposition to the picture presented in the Bible as a whole. Amen. The word of truth, that is the word set. The word that constitutes truth in the scriptures. So let's be clear. There is nothing wrong with large church congregations. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying study for yourself so that whoever's at the pulpit, you know what's coming out of their mouth. Is it truth or is it error? There's nothing wrong with a large church congregation as long as what they are teaching aligns with obedience to biblical commands and not rules made up by a man. Even if they carry the title of pastor, father, minister, padre, priest, or even pope. Those of you who are Bible scholars understand where I'm getting at. You guys remember this picture? Daniel? So Nebuchadnezzar was given a dream. The Holy Spirit interpreted that dream to Daniel, and Daniel was able to interpret that to King Nebuchadnezzar. But what did King Nebuchadnezzar do with that information? Instead of using the knowledge to God's glory, he said, I'm going to make this statue all of gold. All right, not just the head. I'm going to be the whole thing. His image will be made all of gold, symbolic throughout Babylon as eternal, as an eternal, indestructible, all-powerful kingdom. And his kingdom would break in pieces. All other kingdoms would stand forever. Now, clearly, that's wrong. That's not what God said. Ellen White. So Daniel's interpretation was to be rejected and forgotten. Truth was to be misinterpreted and misapplied. Now think about that in a church setting. The symbol design of heaven to unfold to the minds of men important events of the future was to be used to hinder the spread of the knowledge that God desired the world to receive. Thus, the, thus, through the devisings of ambitious men, Satan was seeking to thwart the divine purpose for the human race. The enemy of mankind knew that pure truth, unmixed with error, is a power and mighty to save. But when used to exalt self and to further the projects of men, it becomes a power for evil. Are we tracking church? You guys understand where I'm coming from. If you don't, please study for yourself. There's deep meaning in here, but we don't have time to go through it. Question. Answer for yourself. You can answer quietly. Can Satan use men and take something called church to mix error with truth? Something designed to give people a knowledge of God and of, of, and of future events. This is why we're here. I'm here to give you, the Holy Spirit is here to give you a knowledge of God and of future events. However, in some cases, this setting, this church setting is being used by men being controlled by Satan who want to exalt themselves and to further their projects and at the same time mixing truth with error. Don't take my word for it. Study God's truth for yourself. I've been, I used to work security for one of the large churches here on the island. And it wasn't for crowd control. It wasn't for parking. You know, it, it was specifically because they had so much money coming in to their congregation, they needed armed escorts to get from their church to their bank and back. And then we'd do it for the next sanctuary. We'd do it for the next service and the next service and the next service. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. Why should we go to church then? The clear word says, so let's be compassionate and give some thought to how we can spur each other on toward loving good deeds. Don't give up the habit of worshiping together. That's not what I'm saying, all right? We have to still come to church to worship together. 
as some have already done, but encourage each other all the more as you see the signs of the great day approaching. When COVID hit and we all jumped online, I'll be the first to say, I kind of enjoyed just waking up, turning on YouTube, watching the church service, great. And when it's done, cool, I'm back, I'm still at home. I didn't have to get ready, barely had to brush my teeth. All right, come on, it was convenient. But what were we missing out? Fellowship. Fellowship, right? If I didn't have you folks as my church family, if I didn't have trusted people that I could turn to, right? Like Daniel, Cece, Tony, and Cynthia, and all of you folks, right? When, when I needed you folks most, you were there. And if I were at home just watching on YouTube, Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath, I may not have that connection with them. Let us consider one another. Jesus meets us wherever we are, in whatever congregation we're at, in your car, wherever, okay? Jesus meets us also in one another to stir up love and good works. Faith and hope can be practiced alone at home, but to exercise love, you need a community. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Some may only go to church if they feel the, that they need it at the time. Like how I did. I'm glad I went. When I was living in the world, I knew that I was intentionally breaking God's laws. Physically, in my heart, anything and everything. And, and it started to eat me up inside. And, and all I could remember was just, Mary, just go to church. Just go to church. So I ended up at uh, Central Church. I was in the back pew. I don't know what the pastor was saying at the time, but I just remember just sitting in the back row just bawling because I knew I had to change. I could not continue the way my life was going. Something had to give. So yes, if you feel the need to come to church, come to church. Whatever church you're at, come to church. God will reach you. God has his sheep everywhere. Amen. Some may only go to church if they feel the need at the time. But our motivation for fellowship must be to obey God and to give to others. From the Blue Letter Bible, the study guide on Hebrews 10, we gather together with believers. Why? To encourage someone who needs to stand strong against the tide of discouragement. I look out into this crowd. I see a lot of strong people. I see a lot of confident people. But you know what? I guarantee you there's somebody in here or somebody online who is breaking down inside. Because we can come to church and we can fake strength. Two, to receive something from God. Three, to give something to God. To encourage each other by our shared faith and values. To bless one another and to work together. So just seeing this picture prompts you to be stimulated. But when does too much stimulation or too much stimulus become too much? Become problematic? Become a hindrance to understanding? Become dangerous? Stimulus overload. You know, like I said, when I used to work at these other, these other churches, there would be, there would be like, like dancing. There would be like smoke shows. I mean, the, the lights, the music, it, it was, it was incredible, right? And that's just here in our, in our little state of, of Hawaii or here in Honolulu. Can you imagine what's happening on the mainland, right? Um, stimulus overload. When I grew up on Kauai, my or my friends, our idea of being fun and, and, and stimulating, we jump in our trucks, lock the hubs, and go four wheeling down the beach in the middle of the night at like 50, 60 miles an hour. Or we would go up into the mountains, right, deep in the night with our flashlight, go four wheeling, probably get stuck, find a nice place to, to take the guns out of the back of our car and just start shooting bottles and cans. That, that's me in the sticks. That's me, right? That's where we grew up on. So 
Think, taking that into consideration, you take somebody like me, like many of you, right, or somebody who doesn't know about God, never heard or very little about God, and you put them into a situation where there's all this lights and, and dancing and, and smoke and, and mirrors and, and all this thing. There's so much stimulation, right? I've been there. I tell you, when we had the youth here the other day or when we go to convocation, there's just, you feel that little, little bit of extra of excitement. Right? When the church is full, when the church is alive, when the, when the kids are singing, right? That, it's that feeling. But imagine that multiplied 10 times over by someone who may not be ready for that. Sorry. Um, so stimulus. Uh, the condition in which the environment presents too many stimuli to be comfortably processed by an individual, resulting in stress and or behavior designed to restore equilibrium. So the situation is so so stimulating, so much stress going on in the mind that in order to restore equilibrium, you may say something or do something or act in a way that you normally would not. A state in which one's senses are so overwhelmed with stimuli to the point that one is unable to process or respond to all of them. Sensory overload impacts emotions, right? This can lead to feelings of panic, agitation, and a sense of being out of control. Additionally, when the brain receives too much information from the senses, focusing, concentrating, and making decisions can be challenging. So, here's an example. Back in 1997, right, I was in my early 20s. Again, this is me and my friend now. Best thing to do is lock the hubs and go four-wheeling, right? We listened to, especially my other friend, he listened to Gabby Pahanui, right? Slack key guitar, country comfort. Um, it was Hawaiian music, right? For some reason, and, and this is, this is a, a Michael Jackson concert that, that we had attended. We didn't view Michael Jackson as in the highest view where we came from. So why we were there, I don't know. I don't even know how we got there, but we were there. So we're in this concert and the, the music is loud. The lights are, are, are just all over the place, right? The crowd is there and, and my friend stands up and he's like, I love you, Michael. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, really? Like something that's totally out of context for this person. Like we, we didn't even have, I don't, I don't even know if we had what a tape, tape back then uh, of Mr. Jackson. But he was, he was probably so overstimulated and he got caught up with the crowd that he said something like that, right? Out of context. So, oh, in 1997, that was the first time Aloha Stadium got sold out. So is it possible that a person who is experiencing stimulus overload in an attempt to restore equilibrium could make a decision or decisions that are unhealthy or out of context of their normal behavior? Yes. Is it possible that a person who is experiencing stimulus overload and was told a lie and or distortion of the truth could believe it? If you've been to one of these churches and you're used to, to it, that type of stimulation, you get it, you're used to, to it, right? But you take somebody like me or somebody who, who knows about Jesus, most people know about Jesus enough that, hey, before we eat, we should pray, right? And maybe that's all they know. But they come to uh, an arena where there's thousands of people and all this going on, right? And they just may take for truth everything that whoever is standing up there in the center is what they're telling them. This is ideally what we should be. Right? We're connected to Jesus through his word, his unfiltered word, his pure word, and through prayer with the Holy Spirit's guidance. Amen? Amen. Satan's goal is to break that connection between you and Jesus any way he can. How does he do that? By gradual desensitizing, right? We want things fast. We want things right now. We want instant gratification. We want louder and louder music, more and more lights. I need to be entertained more and more and more, even at church. What happens when the music at church isn't loud enough to satisfy? What happens when the lights at church aren't enough to stimulate? What happens at church when the dancing isn't intriguing enough? That's when Satan ups the ante and he says, okay, 
I got something for you. He performs great signs so that even he makes fire come down from heaven. He's the next big thing. And you know what? Society is ready for it. They're waiting for it. Because that's what we've been conditioned to do. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Are we tracking Seventh-day Adventist people? Amen. Satan uses many types of worldly distractions in hopes that you take your eyes off of Jesus. Whether it's television, social media, worldly music, or even work. In my, in my case, I couldn't even, I could barely work on this the last two weeks. Alcohol, drugs, how about the internet? www. Anything that takes my eyes off of Jesus, I shouldn't be there. Com. Satan will even use intelligent people, people of status, people with titles, people in high positions to distract you. Perhaps Satan is even using your own family. Right? You want to sit down and study and spend time with God, but your family's got all kinds of chaos going on in the other room. I got to go handle this first. Matthew 24, 24, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, even possible, even the YNI Seventh-day Adventist Church. Ezekiel 28, 12. Satan works behind the scenes, working through men and women, behind the pulpit in a church setting. Right, to take your eyes off of Jesus by mixing truth with error. Church family, study God's word for yourself. Matthew 24, 4 and 5. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Second Thessalonians. All that this man will do will be in accordance with the work of Satan who will also come and display his power by working miracles and all kinds of signs and wonders. Those who do not love the truth enough for God to save them. Those who do not love the truth enough. He's not saying those people don't know the truth. They just don't love the truth enough. They will be swept away by all kinds of deceptions brought about by the power of evil. For this reason, God will allow them to be deceived and they will end up believing a lie. However, they will not be judged because they believed a lie, but because they did not believe the truth and continued to take pleasure in their wickedness. Study God's word for yourself, church family, and everyone online. Acts of the Apostles. Men, women, us, cannot with impunity reject the warnings that God in mercy sends to us. From those who persist in turning from these warnings, God withdraws his spirit, leaving them to the deception that they love. Ellen White, The Study of Psychology. The influence of the mind on the body, as well as of the body and the mind, should be emphasized. Right? It's the importance of the mind and self-control. If Satan can control your mind, he can control your actions. I gotta make sure my volume is off for this one. November 2023, this is the Taylor Swift concert. We're only gonna watch a few seconds of this. Satan is not even hiding anymore. This is what society is watching. This is what society is being entertained by, right? He's desensitizing us to somehow think that this is acceptable. As, a Taylor, as Taylor Swift tours across the country, some fans are claiming that they have post-concert amnesia saying they have trouble remembering the show. Scientists say that this condition stems from sensory overload. 
Some Swifties have taken to social media saying that the experience was so spectacular that they have shaken off some of the memories of the show. So I think it's Dr. Kroll here from Temple University um, says, it's actually a neurologic phenomenon that can happen in any heightened emotional state. Right? As, the, as her fans, as Taylor Swift fans, are going to this concert, there's so much to be excited about that their brain can't even process memories of what's happening. To have something like post-concert amnesia is really not such a bad thing, Dr. Kroll says. I'm like, really? Do you, church family, do you ever want to be in a position where you can't remember what happened to you or what you said or what you did to somebody else or what somebody did to you? That it just didn't have the energy to focus on memory formation at the moment because there was so much stimulation. So while you're in this heightened emotional state, as Dr. Kroll states, I'm asking the question, can you, if you can have amnesia because you're so stimulated by the lights, the music, the sound, the music, the people, can you also have difficulty separating truth from deception? Yes, you can. Knowing this about stimulus overload, is it possible that a person whose brain is overloaded with stimulus, adrenaline, and cortisol may make a wrong decision? Could the same person now take everything a person says as truth, not being, and not being unable to make a clear decision for themselves? Here's my point. You and I have a responsibility to ourselves to study God's words so that you will not be misled by someone up here with bad intentions to mislead you, to, mis to be misled by someone or some organization or some religious system who is being controlled by Satan. Are we tracking? Amen? Amen. Christ's object lessons. God requires the training of the mental faculties. He designs that his servants, us, possess more intelligence and clear discernment than the, than the person in the world. And he is displeased with those who are careless or too lazy to become efficient, well-informed workers. The Lord bids us love him with all of our hearts and with all of our soul and with all of our strength and with all of our mind. Don't sit in the pews and just be spoon-fed by somebody. I'm not saying it's this church. I'm not saying it's anybody else's church. I'm saying you got to study for yourself to understand the difference between truth and error when it's in your face. How can we rightly divide the word of truth without studying the truth in God's word for yourself? Are we tracking? Amen. Amen. Are you feeling sleepy, church family? Because I've been there. I've been there. You know, we spend five days a week, six days a week. We're in, we're in the world, right? Things are moving at 110 miles an hour with our cell I don't even have it with me, but our cell phones, right? The last thing you put down at night before you go to bed, check my email one more time. Okay, nobody even text. Okay, put them down. Right? And first thing you wake up in the morning, oh, who in the kind, whatever, right? It, it's in our face 24-7. And then you're, you're in your car, you're listening to the radio, or you're probably listening to about a man's stereo, which is five cars behind, right? Um, and then you come into a church environment like this, where you put down your cell phone, you put down your social media, right? And all that kind of stuff. What is your brain going to do? It's like, bro, I want to go and rest. And you're going to crash and you're going to fall asleep. Is it, is it any wonder why that happens? Because you're going 100 miles an hour out there, you come in here and you slow down, and your body's all like, yes, I can finally rest. And you fall asleep. Church family, I've been there. I'm not pointing at fingers. If anything, it's pointing at me, because I'm the guy in the back row falling asleep. However, is that being reverent to God? Worship defined by our seven day Adventist commentary to bow down, to worship, to serve, especially with respect to the outward forms of worship, to prostrate oneself, to have reverence. Is falling asleep in church being reverent? No. Right? It's not. Ellen White, Congregation in Small Groups. So I believe she was writing this to the church members in Battle Creek, Michigan. And someone can, like I said, I had a whole bunch of stuff in front of me, but please check me if I'm wrong. 
Um, she writes, success does not depend on the strength or numbers. A large church is not necessarily a strong church. Pastors tend to look upon a large church congregation as ideal for successful ministry, but White counsels the opposite here. She goes on to say that it is not the purpose of God that his people should cluster together and concentrate their influence in a special locality. One of the reasons for this was the negative influence it would have on their witness. She continues, the plan of gathering in large numbers to compose a large church has contracted their influence and narrowed down their sphere of usefulness and is literally putting their light under a bushel. So there's four points here. This is the one. One, she says. Number two, another reason white counsels against large church group is a negative influence on spiritual growth. She states, the members of our large church are not in the most favorable situation for spiritual growth. In referring, to the, in referring to Battle Creek, she emphasizes that many in the church are fast becoming withered branches. She mentions this because many of those who moved to Battle Creek were joining large church congregations and they felt that they had no part to act. There's so many people. They sat in their pews and they shunned all responsibility and effort. The workers are few. And Tony can, Tony takes on, sorry to put you on the spot. Tony takes on so much responsibility. Our church board members take on so much responsibility. Why? Because not everybody is stepping up to the plate. If you feel that you're coming to church and your voice isn't being heard or, you're, or something is, is keeping you from getting involved, I ask you, just please come talk to the pastor, come talk to the elders, right? We, we have work. God has a work for every single person. Everybody has talents. Let's put them to use to God's glory and to the service of others. Because that's our job. That's our purpose. Additionally, the new members often felt that their testimonies were not needed. And consequently, their talents were buried in large congregations. Therefore, White counsels the members that large church congregations prevent personal spiritual growth in one's life. If persons grow up in a large church congregation or join one, they are usually influenced by the majority. Many members think of themselves they wish to enjoy church fellowship and pastoral care, right? They become members of large church, a large prosperous church, and are content to do little for others. When one takes this attitude, other influences loom large in this kind of group. Bringing so many believers together in one place tends to encourage evil surmising and evil speaking. Down to the bold, when a large number are shut up in themselves, engrossed in their own interest, it is thus that their piety becomes weakened and they grow bigoted and self-caring. Finally, when joining a large church congregation, one comes in contact with Phariseeism and self-righteousness, which is a form of godliness without the power thereof. White counsels us that as a result of becoming a member of a large church group, our character in many cases becomes weak. But what does Jesus say about a church size? In Luke 32, 12, 32, he says, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Little flock defined. It's small by design, not to become a physically powerful organization that would make a spectacle of itself. If you love me, keep my commandments, John, uh, God says in John. Question, how are you going to truly know if the church you're attending or the person or group you are following is keeping all of God's commandments in Genesis 20? Answer is a study for yourself. Don't allow yourself to be spoon-fed by a man's interpretation of God's commandments, especially God's fourth commandment. And church family, let's read this together, please. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. 
For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and what? Rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Church family, in conclusion. The mere reading of the word will not accomplish the result designed of heaven. It must be studied and cherished in the heart. The knowledge of God is not gained without mental effort. We should diligently study the Bible, asking God for the aid of the Holy Spirit that we may understand his words. We should take one verse and concentrate the mind on the task of asserting the thought which God has put in the verse for us. We should dwell on the thought till it becomes our own, and we know what saith the Lord. Church family, please, don't be fooled. Study God's word for yourself. Times are coming where you will be challenged on your faith if you haven't been already. Like some of us in this congregation, I know. Study to show yourself approved. Happy Sabbath. Congregation, please rise. eternal bright and fair when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder i'll be there when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn to setting up. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Dear kind, loving Heavenly Father, dear Lord, our prayer this morning is simple. Help us, Lord, to get serious about your second coming. Amen. Fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Remove any distractions, Lord, from our lives that keep us from doing your will. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for us because we are undeserving, Lord. Thank you for providing for us. Keep us safe, Lord, until we can meet again. In Jesus' name, amen.